Hey everyone, it's Stephanie Wong, Cloud Developer Advocate, and today I have again Google Fellow Eric Brewer. Here we have him doing a series of videos. We hope that you have enjoyed them so far, but Eric, we are both so excited for this one because we are gathering our questions from the community, right? I am looking forward to this, it is true. All right, so we have both put out a prompt for questions, and this is meant for anything that you've been curious about around Eric's work over the last decade, any advice that you've had for our next generation of developers, especially in the Kubernetes space. So first off, the first question that we've gathered is, can we make use of Kubernetes in the edge, mainly the Raspberry API devices where security can be a big challenge? Well, people are definitely using Kubernetes at the edge, mostly in the telco space and the retail space. Uh, certainly some well-known large customers actually run Kubernetes clusters in each of their big stores. So it's definitely in use at the edge today. Uh, it also runs on Raspberry Pis, so that's not uh, per se new either, although that is a more constrained way to run for sure. I would say the implicit question though, that it's uh, less secure, I would say is neither true nor false. I would say Kubernetes has not certainly an option to be quite secure, as secure as other things based on say traditional VMs. However, it really comes down to the whole stack. So what is the security of your hardware, for example? Do you have any uh, root of trust in that hardware? Google servers that we put in our data centers actually have a, a hidden key deep inside so that we actually know we're running on a real server. We know that the BIOS is trusted. We know that the OS is trusted. So we build up a trusted stack and run on that. That's historically harder to do at the edge, but it's still a good goal. Right, right. Increasingly important as well, uh, especially given the work that you are doing around bringing security to this Kubernetes and open source era. Uh, now, what about data? So we have another question about what Kubernetes would look like in the, I'm assuming, data analytics space. Currently, data applications are relatively cloud specific. Certainly, Kubernetes started with less focus on data and more focus on services especially stateless services. Those are the easiest to do for lots of reasons. And that goes again back to the 90s as a basic principle. But everyone is building data services on Kubernetes now of, of many flavors, and that it is certainly possible now to do a good job of that. But I think the question sounds like it's more about how do we kind of have the same kind of revolution for data that containers brought to computing or services brought to computing. And that is a, is a great question and it's not easily answered. And but I think the service is a good framing for that, meaning that when I talk about data, it's not just the actual data, it's probably what are the, you know, the methods to use an object-oriented paradigm or the, the APIs around that data. Because if I have an API view in my data, then I also start to talk about policy, who can read it, who can write it, access control kinds of things. Maybe I can force other policies like data locality. This data needs to stay in Europe, for example. So I do think we need a bit better packaging of the data itself and the wrapper around it. And I would say there's groups exploring that, uh, but I would say that's still to be. Right, and this is related, but I think there's also an increasing need for more processing power to do things like machine learning, data analytics, high-performance computing. So what is the future for co-processors in the Kubernetes space, like using GPUs, TPUs, et cetera? Co-processors in general are an important part of any computing future. Uh, we're at the end of Moore's law in the sense that general purpose computing is not getting as fast as it used to per year. The rate of change is slower, which is too bad for all of us. One of the few ways you can make up for that is to have more domain specific hardware. That's what a TPU is for TensorFlow. That's what a GPU is both for graphics and is used for AI. So accelerators are here to stay. And in fact, you can use both TPUs and GPUs from Kubernetes. There's nothing per se wrong with that. I would say, in fact, there's a new offering in Kubernetes on GKE where you can actually uh, subdivide a GPU into smaller pieces. So it's actually easier to use a small amount, particularly for inference, or to use a large amount if you want to do training. But absolutely, that is part of the core feature of Kubernetes. Yeah, and it's been incredible to see the extension and the usage of Kubernetes in the machine learning space, especially with open source platforms like uh, Kubeflow and what we've built into Vertex AI. So it's, it's really exciting and I'm looking forward to seeing where we start to implement those things. 
Now, this question is a common question that I think we get, but talking about on-premise private clouds versus public clouds. But to you, what is the right balance between open public cloud and private closed sovereign clouds for companies? That's a very tricky question, which many countries are worried about. So the short answer is, you'd be better off with a open public cloud pretty much all the time if you can use one because it will have better cost efficiency, will have a higher rate of innovation, it can do more things over time. However, that means you must not only trust your cloud provider, but you also have to trust the government that runs the country in which your cloud provider is based, which for most clouds is the US. So if you're a country that is worried about the US government, you may decide that for at least some of your workloads, that's too risky, and you really want them running in your own country. That's where the word sovereign comes from in these contexts. Now, the good news is something that's based on open source like Kubernetes is amenable to running well in private clouds. That's a big part of Anthos, which is something I've worked on also for both hybrid and multi-cloud. So you'll see us talking about sovereign in terms of our general open cloud extension, because at least that means you can use Kubernetes on GKE. And for some reason you need to exit for whatever reason, you can run Kubernetes on-prem and at least your workloads will be movable. Now, is it trivial to do that? No, but it doesn't have to be trivial, it just has to be possible. Absolutely. It's a tough space, but it's going to continue to evolve over time as our geopolitical climate changes. So it's a lot to think about now. Now, many, many great tech, including Kubernetes and BigQuery, as you know, came from internal Google technology that we've decided to externalize. So I think the community is curious, but what is the next big thing that we are hoping to, or we think we might externalize? Well, I think it just happened, but people didn't realize it, which is Google has great internal solutions for supply chain security. Uh, we've written papers on it. Uh, VCID is an internal name. I don't remember what it stands for, but basically it's a set of invariants about how our software is built such that we can prove things about it before it operates. For example, we can prove internally that every piece of code is in our repo and that multiple people have looked at that code to make sure that it's safe. And those are strong statements to be able to make and we can make them internally. Now to externalize that, it's kind of like externalizing Bigtable. We didn't actually release the actual Bigtable code. And if we had, no one could have used it because it had a lot of dependencies on internal Google stuff. So we wrote a paper, people wrote versions of it externally leading to HSpace and other things. That's one model. The equivalent here is, is Salsa, which is now part of OpenSSF, where it's, this is a framework for how to think about supply chain. But the good news is it's based on what we actually have been doing internally for, for I think at least 10 years. And what we already know works in production. So it's like Bigtable, it's proven in production, but we actually need to externalize it with the community because it's, again, it, it, we need to have buy-in on how it works. It needs to be done in an appropriate way for open source, which is not that easy. Hence, it needs some discussion. That process is going on now. People are absolutely welcome to contribute. It'll also be a big part of the executive order as we move towards secure supply chains in general for the nation. Exactly, exactly. It can't be done in a vacuum. And uh, we are inviting the community to help us bring these things to the broader industry as a whole. So that is a great note to end on, Eric. I know that you have shared your time with us over the span of this video series. So I just wanna thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your experience. Well, my pleasure and, and great to be involved in this way. Thank you so much. For everybody else, we hope that you enjoyed this video series. Let us know if you want more like this. And if you do have thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, jokes, Check us out on social, reach out to us on Twitter. We'll include our handles here. Thank you so much, everyone.